I'm going to talk briefly about three things, selection and sequencing of reforms, the coverage of reforms across the PFM cycle, and make a comment on this question of basic versus advanced reforms. The good news is that there are strong echoes of the research findings the report we're presenting with the discussion this morning and the points made by the ministries, which bears out um, some of the case study research, but also more recent practice. The first point to note is donors and their assessments were dominant but problematic in the question of reform, selection and sequencing. We heard earlier about a lot of ad hoc activity by multiple actors and fragmentation in the early years, only coalescing towards coordinated reform programmes and efforts over the course of a few years. The focal point for that coordination and coalescence was often a comprehensive multi-donor PFM reform assessment. Many of those happened to coincide with the emergence of PIFA as a framework and a tool which, which donors and governments were able to jointly come behind. The weakness apparent in most of the countries in the autonomous ability of the government to articulate its reform priorities, decide on its reform strategy, was quite a notable feature of all the cases in the early period except for West Bank Gaza. And that created the conditions in which external actors were in some cases inclined to colonise that space and to in, in introduce their own reform priorities. One of the points I think we could come back to in discussion usefully is that question of, of policy space. <coughs> Covering the budget cycle and the associated institutions and organisations, we've heard already that the legal framework is not an important driver. That was a finding also of this report. The legal framework in the early stages wasn't required in order to motivate and propel reforms across the eight countries we looked at. Comprehensive legal reform frameworks typically came up to eight years later. The significance of this finding is that it's slightly at odds with some of the standard world, um, IMF guidance on the initial introduction of legal frameworks as the basis for reform. Practice was often consolidated through legal reforms once those practical changes had been implemented. The second point to note is that uh, the enactment of legislation isn't a sufficient indication of whether legal reform had taken place. There was a lot of effort ongoing, but actually its ability to be passed by Parliament often came late for, for, vet, for political reasons. Organisationally, we looked at the significance of, or to, uh, to a limited degree, the significance of combined joint ministries of finance, planning, budget, and the relationship with PFM reform. We only touched on this subject, but we found there tended to be stronger impetus and motivation behind reform where there were coordinated functions within one ministry and much greater challenges where the functions were split across multiple agencies. Next slide, please. Budget formulation improved in basic terms. Basic meaning getting the annual budget up and running again. That was a clear and obvious priority. If you include the word annual, it wasn't always annual. Simply getting a budget passed, which could have been a part-year budget, was a significant and important priority, which um, was, was driven by some of the imperative to get money flowing, as we've heard. Some attention to basic fiscal aggregates, in some cases multi-year fiscal frameworks, but simply the <coughs> aggregate fiscal position year on year was an early priority, and the capacity development in central finance ministries associated with macro fiscal analysis was consistent with that. More complex reforms, we're sorry to find, had very limited traction across all of the cases. There were early efforts uh, with multi-year budgeting tools such as medium-term expenditure frameworks, with efforts to put the budget on a programmatic format, a programmatic format much more strongly linked to policy priorities and results and programmes. There seemed to be little indication of clear success, especially in the early years, despite repeated efforts with those. Finally, the weakness of recurrent and investment budgets persisted throughout the period, in, in, or the weak linkages between in most of the cases. On budget execution, there was rather a contrasting picture in that this was a quite a strong success story early on. We've heard earlier from Afghanistan and from Sierra Leone at the progress made on downstream budget execution issues. Restoring basic fiscal control through cash-based expenditure management was a priority in many of the cases. Some of the measures that received early attention were revision of the chance for accounts, centralisation of cash management through 
Treasury single accounts. This was a, a surprising priority for us, but one that seemed to in, enjoy a degree, quite a strong degree of traction, even in those countries where um, the circumstances seem least auspicious. DR Congo, for example, managed to close quite a number of Lime Industry Bank accounts, even though the, the complex picture of, of decentralised government. Subnational rollout progressed in one or two cases, um, FMIS, and we heard a little bit earlier from that. The more challenging reforms around budget execution were around procurement. That's an issue that was picked up earlier. Laws were proposed, implemented on the statute in some cases, but practice of procurement reforms around actual procurement practice typically didn't follow. Equally weak, in some cases, were issues of internal audits, internal control, where governments struggled either to introduce those reforms or, in some cases, to, to, to share the motivation for them. Moving to budget accountability, the effort and the progress was correspondingly marginal. It sustained um, an early focus in some cases. We've heard about the audit agent function in Afghanistan, in Sierra Leone, also through the LTAs there was some focus on, on external audit, but it typically emerged as a later priority for most countries. The caveat on legal framework is perhaps important here and picks up a point raised earlier in discussion. The lack of legal and constitutional mandate and protection around the oversight function, some of the external audit function, did prov provide something of a hindrance in some cases to these, to these, uh, the progression with these functions. And that seemed to sit at odds where legal reforms weren't necessarily important for other areas of reform. Heavy use of outsourcing external technical assistance and consultants, sometimes in line positions, often externally funded, was, was a strong feature of this domain. Perhaps the weakest of all areas across all countries in the PFM cycle was parliamentary engagement, particularly in the downstream budget process, and the role of parliamentary public accounts committees and their inclination and capacity to engage seriously with the, uh, with the, the accountability for public use of public resources and government expenditure. <coughs> Moving on to the coverage of actors, this in summary picks up a point raised earlier that most of the action was at central finance agency level. Most of the focus was on strengthening finance agency control directly. That seemed to be a shared motivation between external donor agency supporting reform and government reform actors driving the process. Corresponding with active efforts to strengthen the central finance agency ministries and functions was a corresponding effort to reduce the discretion of line ministries and central and subnational governments. Reforms such as the TSAs and the automisation of process and reduced discretion were examples of that. The extension into full, the full geographical reach of the territories was also rather slow. There were some emerging efforts in one or two of the countries, for example, Afghanistan and Kosovo, but most of the action again was capital city centric or at least a limited geographical segment. The final point I wanted to mention briefly was to put some thoughts out on this question of basics versus advanced. The standard analysis, still heavily informed by Alan Schick from many years ago, talks about doing basics first and the design assumption underwritten into many reform programs is around avoidance of technical complexity first and the basic systems up and running. According to this analysis, basic and advanced is typically held by most of us to consider either the technical complexity or the sense of logical progression, which things should happen before which other in order to make them possible. However, in the cases that we looked at, the analysis that, that appears to emerge is that this formulation of complexity is possibly not sufficient to explain reform feasibility and reform possibility. And four or five other factors seem to be at work that govern and condition the ability to progress and pursue reforms of basic or technical nature. The level of human capacity, both in ability to implement technical reforms and in the management of the ministries of finance, the ability to articulate and lead reform agendas, is also a critical factor which doesn't always come into the equation. Secondly, a point that echoes some of the thinking from the WDR and some of the Matt Andrews analysis of the concentration or deconcentration of actors, the, uh, the, where multiple poles of PFM action are involved, it's more difficult to progress reforms. 
formalization of processes and the, the reforms that typically create that greater formalization and risk undermining vested interests were another factor of complexity, as were the point, the point made earlier about the centre performance orientation and how consistent or inconsistent that is with the real incentives, be those around patrimonial or client politics, or equally the ability to hold together fractious um, coalitions in a state-building process. So to summarise, as we've covered, there was a mix of basic measures and advanced measures upstream and downstream. And if we go to the next slide, we can see that pattern reflected across this just shows that across some, some PIFA assessments, we see that some of the downstream reforms were relatively strong, such as cash management, but externally it was, was the weakest. In this mix, there are, sorry, if you go, go back one again, yeah, you see there is a, so there's a mixture of what we would typically consider to be advanced and basic reforms throughout these countries. Final slide, please. So what might we take as some emerging lessons for discussion from this? First of all, as I said, the, the conventional discussion of basic versus advanced doesn't necessarily help us with sequencing and entry points. There's a rather more complex picture that needs to be examined and the underlying factors. And the sequencing apparent from the case studies suggests that constraints from contextual factors, on the one hand, may also be opportunities for other reforms for some <laughs> of the same reasons, political incentives, institutional change and institutional flux, and other agendas, the, the priority to demonstrate legitimacy as a viable or emerging state, the ability to demonstrate to the international community some competence around the core functions of public financial management, were strong motivators of progress that created opportunities in, advance, in reforms that might otherwise be considered rather advanced and rather sophisticated. This finally suggests that we may need to rethink our entry points. If budget execution reforms seem to hold traction for a range of reasons, we might pursue those, but if we are not seeing the progress with improvements around budget allocation, internal control, financial accountability, despite persistent efforts, we might want to rethink how and why we're engaging with those and think about more, more innovative approaches to those sorts of reforms. Thank you. Thank you, Ed.